This morning I want to start out with the verses that are probably the best known. The one verse is the best known verse literally in all of Christendom. John 3.16 And then from that we're going to develop the great missing part of the gospel that people have when they read just John 3.16 without reading John 3.17. And this will encompass literally God's Israel and the earth. God's Israel and the earth. John 3.16 says of Christ, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. This is printed, I imagine, in millions upon millions of tracts every year throughout all of Christendom. It goes to all the heathen. It's preached from practically every radio pulpit in the land and also from the churches. Over and over and over you hear John 3.16, and of course it's true and we don't deny it. But I believe that it is not complete unless you also read John 3.17, the very next verse. For God sent not his Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. Now it seems as if this almost brings out antagonism from so many people. When you tell them, yes, I know, God is saving millions of people. He's going to save more, but he's also going to save the world. They don't want that. They try to get away from the idea of the world and say, well, the world is not my home. I'm just passing through and so on. And sometimes we're accused of being literally worldly because we preach and teach the thoughts embodied here in John 3.17. Before we go on, first of all, you should realize that there's some meaning in here that has a great to do with the rest of the gospel. For instance, the word world here is used uh, in John 3.17, comes from the Greek word cosmos, and it means more than just the earth. It means the earth and all those things that are upon it. It means the people and nations and all of these things that are upon this planet earth. So it doesn't mean just the world system, and it doesn't mean just the Uh, planet or the physical planet itself, it means the world or the earth and all that that is upon it. And uh, condemn uh, is not just exactly the thing that we usually use when we think of condemnation. Uh, This is a slightly different word that is translated condemn here, and this is the only place it's used in the New Testament is in these two verses, verse 17 and 18, and it means literally to decide or to try. It has a connotation more of a trial, as if you had uh, the world up here in front of God Almighty, and then there were to be a trial and a judgment. Now, if God were to try the world, as we would think of the word try in relation to trial, the world as it is, it would mean that God would have to find it guilty or not guilty. He would have to decide that if it's guilty, of course, what would that mean? That means judgment, punishment, and destruction. If it's not guilty, then that would mean it can go on as it is. And as we develop this, you'll see that neither of these are going to take place. So therefore, it doesn't mean exactly what we would mean in relation to punishment or judgment or condemnation. There is a trying of the world, but the decision is not destruction or approval. The decision is change, and you'll see that as we go along our uh, left-wing opponents today, you know, they use this word change, change, change all the time. I think perhaps uh, maybe they're helping condition Christian people to the fact that this world is going to be changed. Now, it's not going to be changed to communism, as the communists hope, and it's not going to be brought to destruction, as some of the Christians preach, but there will be actual change of the earth and its people. And I believe that this is such good news that the Christian people should hear what John 3.17 means along with John 3.16. All right, turn with me over to Colossians in chapter um, 1. And Paul is speaking of Christ, and in verse 16 and 17 he describes the creation of the heaven and the earth in relation to Christ. And he says, For by him were all things created that are in heaven and that are in earth, visible and invisible, whether they be thrones or dominions or principalities or powers, all things were created by him and for him. And then here is the purpose 
of this creation. And as I read it, you remember, this means the earth or the world or the cosmos. We apologize for the missing audio in this portion of Pastor Emery's sermon. Occasionally, the original cassette tape recordings have deteriorated, and portions of the audio have been lost. He is the one by whom all this world stands. And I think we should be a little careful with our idea that we should condemn the earth when God says he created it. There is another segment of original audio missing here. And I will show thee things which must be hereafter. And immediately I was in the Spirit, and behold, a throne was set in heaven, and one sat on the throne. Now John is seeing a vision of God Almighty. There is another segment of original audio missing here. And then he goes on in verse 3, And he that sat was to look upon like a jasper and a sardine stone, and there was a rainbow round about the throne in sight like unto an emerald. Then he goes on and describes all these things that he sees, or this manifestation of God Almighty, And then down in verse 8, And the four beasts had each of them six wings about him, and they were full of eyes within, and they rest not day nor night, saying, Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty, which was and is and is to come. And when those beasts give glory and honor and thanks to him that sat on the throne, who liveth forever and ever, the four and twenty elders fall down before him that sat on the throne and worship him, that liveth forever and ever, and cast their crowns before the throne, saying, Now all of this that John has seen has built up a great vision of power and magnitude and worship by angelic beings, and here is the one little thing they say in one verse. Thou art worthy, O Lord, to receive glory and honor and power, for thou hast created all things, and for thy pleasure they are and were created." We were discussing these same verses in our Sunday school class, and you know, of all of the religions and the so-called gods upon the earth, it is only our God and His Word that teaches this idea over and over and over. God created all the heavens and all the earth, and everything that exists was created by God Almighty. You know, the uh, so-called heathen or pagan people have all sorts of gods. And they give their gods in their own minds power over certain things. They have gods that have power over the wind. They have gods that have power over fishes. They have gods of the sea. And they have gods of the thunder. And they have gods which they give all sorts of power. They they give their gods even credit for teaching certain moral teachings. But this God, our God, the only God, is the only one who refers to himself over and over and over as the God who created all things. Now you see, the very idea of creation places him above all other things. Because if he is the creator, what does this leave the other gods? Well, it leaves them nothing. And uh, I think sometimes that uh, we get a small vision of our God because we forget that even in the prophecies, as the prophet spoke of him, uh, quite often it would say, Thus saith the Lord the creator of the heavens and the earth. Thus saith the Lord, the God of Israel, and the creator of the heavens and the earth. Hundreds of times in the Bible we get this idea that he created all things. And then as these four and twenty elders worship him, they add the other thought. And for thy pleasure they are and were created. Isn't it interesting that with all the supposed things that they could have said to this God... You know, to say that, well, he is honest, or he's glorious, or he's righteous, or he shines brighter than the stars. There is a million things they could have said. But they said, really, only two things. You have created all things, and all things are created for your pleasure. Now, if we get this idea of God, you can understand how that teaching of this God would just cast aside all other gods. And eventually, as this comes to the knowledge and understanding of the people, they will turn away from their idols. Now he goes right on in the uh, next chapter, and uh, as we read this and the rest of these, you kind of think with me how tragic it is that there is so much teaching and preaching today on the idea that God is going to give up his creation. He's going to uh, take his people away from the earth. He's going to let the devil have the earth. Many people tell us that the earth is going to be completely destroyed, going to be burned up. This creation of God is going to be all destroyed because it's just too corrupt. Well, let's go on in chapter 5. 
And I saw in the right hand of him that sat on the throne a book, written within and on the backside, sealed with seven seals. And I saw a strong angel proclaiming with a loud voice, Who is worthy to open the book and to loose the seals thereof? And no man in heaven nor in the earth, neither under the earth, was able to open the book, neither to look thereon. Here is this vision that John saw of God Almighty who created the heavens and the earth, and now there's a book, and no one can open it. Here it is, it's sealed. And John apparently recognized the seriousness of this situation because he says, And I wept much, because no man was found worthy to open and to read the book, neither to look thereon. In spite of everything that John saw about the glory and the majesty of God Almighty, he recognized that that book had to be opened for some reason. And John actually says that he wept because the book wasn't open. And one of the elders saith unto me, Weep not, behold, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, hath prevailed to open the book and to loose the seven seals thereof. What is this? This, of course, is a prophecy of the Lord Jesus Christ. He says to John, Don't weep, the lion of the tribe of Judah will open this book. And I beheld, and lo, in the midst of the throne and of the four beasts, and in the midst of the elders stood a lamb, as it had been slain, having seven horns and seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God sent forth into all the earth. And he came and took the book out of the right hand of him that sat upon the throne. And when he had taken the book, the four beasts and the four and twenty elders fell down before the lamb, having every one of them harps and golden vials full of odors, which are the prayers of saints, just think of this uh, majestic vision, as it were, and we realize this is symbolic and it's a vision. But this God of great power and majesty who has created all things, in order for these things to go on in the way that John recognized they must go on, the book has to be opened. And we find that the Lion of the tribe of Judah, the Lamb of God, slain from the foundation of the world, has power to open the book, and before him... We find golden vials full of odors, or the margin says incense, which are the prayers of saints. You'll notice the presence of the prayers before the Lamb, before he opens the book. Brother, sister, you sometimes think that maybe prayer isn't so important. In the very presence of Jesus Christ, as he is going to open this book, which John cried or wept about for it not being opened, in the very presence of him are the prayers of the saints. And then he goes on. And they sung, or these elders sung a new song, saying, Thou art worthy to take the book and to open the seals thereof, for thou wast slain and hast redeemed us to God by thy blood out of every kindred and tongue and people and nation, and hast made us unto our God kings and priests, and we shall reign on the earth. Yes, we shall reign on the earth. Here is all this majesty and this vision and what does it say as far as the final culmination of what this has to do with us and with the people and the people who worship God he has made us kings and priests unto God and we shall reign on the earth now let's go on and read just a few more and I beheld and heard a voice of many angels round about the throne and the beasts and the elders and the number of them was ten thousand times ten thousand, and thousands of thousands. And these words are literally innumerable. The Greek word is myriads, and we use that to indicate something that can't even be counted. Saying with a loud voice, Worthy is the Lamb that was slain to receive power and riches and wisdom and strength and honor and glory and blessing. And every creature which is in the heaven and on the earth and under the earth and such as are in the sea, and all that are in them, heard I saying, Blessing, and honor, and glory, and power be unto him that sitteth upon the throne, and unto the Lamb, for ever and ever. And the four beasts said, Amen. And the four and twenty elders fell down and worshipped him that liveth for ever and ever. Now here we have a uh, rather detailed story of the vision of God Almighty in his heavenly throne, Having all power, he's the creator of the heaven and the earth. And we find that really, when you come right down to it, there are only two reasons that these four and twenty elders fell down before God and fell down before the Lamb. One is that he is the creator, and one that he is the redeemer. 
You'll notice that they fell down and worshipped. On number 1, in verse 11 of chapter 5, they fell down and worshipped him because he had created all things. And then they again fell down before the Lamb slain from the foundation of the world because he had redeemed all things. Now, these two stories, creation and redemption, are absolutely necessary and essential that they be understood together. We so often hear of redemption, you know, I think sometimes it's preached as such a little thing that we don't really realize that it means redemption of God's creation. Not just the salvation of a little soul. And I don't mean to imply that souls are little or are of no consequence because one is as important as a thousand in the sight of God. But you'll notice in this great vision that John had been given, once we find because of creation they fell down and worshipped God and once because of this redemption and of course remember the creation was for his pleasure I must assume that the redemption was also for God's pleasure it was done for the same purpose and redemption was for this purpose and let's read verse 10 again and has made us unto our God kings and priests and we shall reign on the earth. Now, prior to being made kings and priests, we were literally creation. We were a creature, a man. God has made us, through redemption, something higher than we were through creation. And would to God that we could get this idea across to people that when God Almighty talks about His creation and redemption in all of these verses we find it includes this planet Earth. This idea that the Earth is about all done and the devil is about taken over and uh, wickedness of man is just God is going to have, be able to do nothing except destroy it, of course, is actually blasphemy against the power of the blood of redemption. You try and tell us that uh, God can't handle this creation or can't do this, you find that these four and twenty elders... And these two chapters of Revelation, really, when you think about it, they give as much praise and honor for redemption as they do for creation. In other words, there must be as much power in redemption as there was in creation. Otherwise, they would not have reacted in the same manner for both things. All right, let's go back to some of the prophets here for a few minutes. First of all, let's read uh, Genesis 1. Because in the first chapter of Genesis, God lays out a... There is another segment of original audio missing here. We don't realize the uh, implications of it. In the first chapter, in the first verse, the first words of the Bible, of course, tell us, in the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. So this is the creation. This is in indicating that God was the creator. But in verse 31, after the creation has been made, we find that God saw everything that he had made, and behold, it was very good. We read in Revelation 4 that he created for his pleasure. And we'd assume that he did create it good for his pleasure. Now turn over to Isaiah 45. And you'll remember as we read this now, because in Revelation we found that creation and redemption are told about in the same identical vision. The vision did not change. It was in the same vision. Now in Isaiah 45 and verse 18, I read this, For thus saith the Lord that created the heavens, God himself that formed the earth and made it, he hath established it, he created it not in vain, he formed it to be inhabited, I am the Lord and there is none else. Again, here is this very simple principle that God Almighty created the earth for a purpose. He didn't create it in vain. He didn't create it and then is going to lose it at some future date. He created it for the purpose of being inhabited. And again, just think of how much of the preaching of today that leads people to believe that their permanent abode is in heaven and they're going to leave the earth And I know from talking to some of you people. I get letters. I even have people that call me on the phone to ask me, Pastor Emery, what can I say to my brother? What can I say to my son? What can I say to my sister or my neighbor or the people I attend church with? They're not interested in the earth at all. 
They don't even want to talk about it. They don't want to carry on a conversation about the earth. All they want to talk about is they're going to heaven and they're just waiting until next Sunday night or something like that whenever Christ is going to come and is going to take them to heaven. You wonder why this earth is in the terrible situation it's in? Just think for one moment. If in 1600 somebody had invented a radio and a television and a high-speed printing press and had immediately been, had started preaching the rapture of the church off from the earth prior to the Great Tribulation. Can you imagine good, godly Christian people getting in a boat and spending three months on the North Atlantic trying to get to a continent that's, uh, whatever it is, five or 6,000 miles away to try and establish a new civilization? Brother, sister, they never would have gone. They never would have gone. A lady called me from Tucson about ten days ago to ask me this question because her son is not going to continue his college education and prepare for a job because he's convinced the rapture of the church is going to take place within a matter of days or weeks or months and there's no point in preparing for anything here upon the earth. Do you realize how deadly this teaching is? That God is going to abandon the earth and is going to take his people and let the devil have the earth? She told me about a Bible study where one man in the Bible study class actually broke down in tears and was crying. And the reason he was crying because he was going to be raptured and he was going to have to leave his two little girls here to go through the Great Tribulation. And it was a very sorrowful thing. His heart was practically broken. And what was he crying? He was crying over false doctrine. Things that do not fit the Scripture at all. The great hope of mankind, of Israel, is God's redemption for his creature and his creation, the earth. All right. God himself that formed the earth and made it, he hath established it, he created it not in vain, he formed it to be inhabited. And you'll notice that this verse starts out with the word for. You know, F-O-R, starts out with the word for. Well, it means that these things that he said in verse 18, he said because of what he'd just gotten through saying, and let's read what he'd just said before that, verse 17. But Israel shall be saved in the Lord with an everlasting salvation. Ye shall not be ashamed nor confounded world without end. For God created the earth to be inhabited, and so on and so on and so on. Here we find Israel... Israel's redemption, again, tied up completely and totally with God's creation and God's purpose on the earth. The two verses fit together. Now, I often hear kingdom identity preachers use verse 17 and they don't go on into verse 18. So we have the same problem here in Isaiah that we have with the other people in John 3, 16 and 17. Verse 17 and verse 18 must and should be read together. Israel's redemption is because God has created the heavens and the earth to be inhabited and not to destroy them. Israel shall be saved in the Lord with an everlasting salvation. Ye shall not be shamed nor confounded. Now why didn't God just stop there? Isn't it interesting that he added just those other words and then the next verse. Ye shall not be confounded nor world without end. Would to God that we could get this good news across to people who love the Lord and love His Word that Israel's redemption is designed to be on a world without end. And of His kingdom there shall be no end. And as we read in Revelation 5 and 10 that we are kings and priests and we shall reign on the earth. All right, let's go back to... um, some of the promises here rather quickly and uh, just read a few of the things that God Almighty said to Israel. Exodus 19. And I want to show you how the covenants, the promises that God made with Israel fit the very things we read in John 3:16 and 17 and Revelation 4 and 5 and so on. Exodus 19. We'll start in verse 3. This is at Mount Sinai as you know. And Moses went up unto God, and the Lord called unto him out of the mountain, saying, Thus shalt thou say to the house of Jacob, and tell the children of Israel, 
Ye have seen what I did unto the Egyptians, and how I bare you on eagles' wings, and brought you unto myself. Now therefore, if ye will obey my voice indeed, and keep my covenant, then ye shall be a peculiar treasure unto me above all people, for all the earth is mine. You notice how again and so often God's choosing of his Israel people is directly connected to his creation and his purpose for the earth. He says, you're going to be a special people because all the earth is mine. For all the earth is mine. Let's turn over to Deuteronomy. I'm going to read a few of these, and as I do, you'll recognize that there are literally scores of verses that are practically identical to the ones that I'm reading. I'm just reading a few. In Deuteronomy 7, as Moses repeats again God's choosing of Israel and his purposes, in verse 6 he says to Israel, For thou art an holy people unto the Lord thy God. The Lord thy God hath chosen thee to be a special people unto himself above all people that are upon the face of the earth. He didn't say, I've chosen you for some purposes out here in space or something like that. Or I've chosen you so that your descendants at some future time will be taken off the earth as I turn the Satan, turn the world over to Satan and the heathen. No, he says, Israel, I've chosen you to be above all people. Where? On the earth. Above all people that are upon the face of the earth. Deuteronomy 14, verse 2. For thou art an holy people unto the Lord thy God, and the Lord hath chosen thee to be a peculiar people unto himself above all the nations that are upon the earth. Deuteronomy 26, verses 18 and 19. And the Lord hath avouched thee this day to be his peculiar people, and he hath promised thee, and that thou shouldest keep all his commandments, and here's the reason, to make thee high above all nations, which he hath made in praise and in name and in honor, and that thou mayest be an holy people unto the Lord thy God, hath he has spoken. Now where is all of this going to take place? All of the fulfillments of the covenants to Israel are going to take place one place, here on the earth. And I, I know I, uh, you run into the same trouble that I do when you start preaching the kingdom of God on the earth. People just don't like it. They just don't want to have it. Now, the reason for the antagonism, and I'm not going to go into the scripture on the identity, but I think you people recognize that unless you have a proper and a correct identity of the house of Israel, you cannot follow through with the rest of these scriptures and make any sense out of them. Because the New Testament teaches us, very simply and obviously, that Christ has chosen his Christian people for a reward that far exceeds anything that the unbelievers will receive. In fact, the heathen and the unbelievers and the ungodly are told over and over they're going to be punished, they're going to be destroyed, and so on and so on. So, if you think that God's Christian people are a different people than the house of Israel, then you have to find two places for people to receive their rewards. So, they have made up this fantastic story that the Christian people are going to go to heaven for their rewards, and that the Jews, whom they call Israel, are going to get their rewards on the earth. Now, sometimes people wonder, why Pastor Emery and why Pastor Stasliv and Record and the rest of these men spend so much time trying to convince people of the identity of the house of Israel? Well, brother, sister, if you don't know the identity of the house of Israel, you can't understand what God meant in Genesis 1-1 or in Revelation 4 as far as his purposes upon the earth. His purposes are completely and totally tied in with Israel upon the earth. For the same reason that we found that they bowed down before Christ for the redemption, as they bowed down before Jehovah for the creation. And this error of teaching that the Jews are the house of Israel destroys the knowledge or understanding of everything that I've said so far in this sermon. You can't make head or tail out of it if you think the Jews are Israel instead of the Anglo-Saxon people. All right, let's read just a few verses of some of the prophets, and we'll go right on through into uh, the uh, New Testament. Turn over to Isaiah 11. These are quite familiar, but I think they should be in here. Isaiah 11 and verse 9 says, 
Speaking of the end of the age, they shall not hurt nor destroy.